Intriguing and tumultuous times in our nation's capital and a pivotal point in our relations with many foreign countries, from investigations of the president and his inner circle to building a wall on the Mexico border, from relations with North Korea to the challenges presented by China and Russia. Idaho Senator Jim Risch has a prime seat to see it all and to play a key role in the direction of U.S. foreign and domestic policy. Today, the new chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on his vision for his new role and his take on the big issues of the day. Ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. And welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. Idaho Senator Jim Risch was elected chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in early January. He is the third Idahoan to serve as its chairman. Senator William Bora was chair from 1925 to 1933, and Frank Church chaired the committee in 1979 and 80. According to the committee website, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee dates back to 1816. It has jurisdiction over legislation concerning the conduct of U.S. foreign policy, including foreign assistance, treaties, and declarations of war. It also oversees the U.S. State Department and reviews executive branch nominations that carry out U.S. diplomacy, including Secretary of State and U.S. ambassadorships. My guest today is the chairman of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Republican Senator Jim Risch, also on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee and the Select Committee on Intelligence, among others. Busy man, thank you for being here, Senator thank Risch. Thank you. Appreciate Glad it. to be here. So you've been in the role now a couple months as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. How do you view your role there uh, in, in guiding that committee through its business? Well, first of all, I've been sitting on the committee and the Intelligence Committee for 10 years each mm -hmm. since I've been there. So um, it, it isn't really a new thing, but obviously being chairman uh, is new. And uh, look, I'm an Idahoan. I view everything through the prism uh, of Idaho. Certainly this new role is a national role and indeed an international role, but still got Idaho blood in my veins and, uh, and that's how I, how I view things. Um, we're a, uh, Idaho's a producer state. Uh, we produce commodities, be it agricultural, technological, uh, potato chips to microchips. Uh, the result of that is uh, we have to sell our products and 95% of our customers are outside the borders of the United States. So one of the top views I have is that our relationship needs to be as good as it can possibly be with all 200 other countries uh, on the face of the earth. and. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that's how we approach it. So what do you see as the key as chairman for how the committee flows? And flows? Well, first of all, the founding fathers, you know, were very clear on the first branch of government, the second branch of government on some things. That is appropriations, money was all in the hands of the first branch. Executing policy was in the hands of the second branch. When it comes to foreign relations, uh, both the construction of uh, foreign policy and the execution of foreign policy is a much more uh, gray line and there is a joint responsibility given to both uh, branches of government. So uh, look, uh, it's really important that we pull the wagon together uh, with the second branch of government. And as you know, it's, uh, there's always tension, has been since George Washington was president between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And uh, uh, my view is to harmonize that as best as possible and make it work as, uh, as good as it possibly can. Uh, I want to get, of course, to some of the big foreign relations sure. issues in a, just a minute. Lots but, of them. But I'd like to, to get your take on some of the big you know, storylines sure. that are happening in Washington, D.C. right now. First of all, with the Mueller investigation into Russian meddling in the election, Democrats now investigating the president and his inner circle, uh, Democrats in charge of the House, Senate, uh, Republicans right. in charge of the Senate. What is the climate like right now in D.C.? Well, let's unpack those one at a time, uh, starting with the, <laughs> the, time, the, right? yeah, <laughs> the Mueller investigation. Uh, look, um, the, the Mueller investigation was supposed to be just what we're in the process of on the Intelligence Committee, and that is an investigation of Russian meddling in the 2016 election. We, we've looked at hundreds of thousands of documents, interviewed uh, dozens and dozens uh, of people, and uh, we're, we're pretty much uh, there as far as conclusions are concerned. The Mueller investigation started there, but now it has broadened greatly mm -hmm. so that you see the indictments that are coming down and that sort of thing, and they, they really have not much to do in uh, with the Russian uh, aspect of the 2016 uh, investigation. It's crystal clear that the Russians did their best to uh, interfere in the 2016 election. It's crystal clear that they were unsuccessful. Uh, so far, they found no connection of uh, the Trump campaign, which they set out to do, uh, of being involved with the Russians in that. So, 
uh, in my mind, uh, we're, uh, we got uh, a lot of other things to do, but, uh, but this is good because of the political aspects of it. This is going to go on for some time. Look, this is my third investigation on the Intel Committee. When I got there, they were talking about the, the uh, we did an investigation of the torture uh, after 9-11. Uh, 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 the next one was the Benghazi investigation, and now we're in this, in the Russian investigation, we're winding up. Do you, uh, we keep hearing any day now on the Mueller investigation. Do you know uh, when I, it might come you out? You know, I really don't. You know, I'm privy to what we're doing and, and how we're doing it and, and the when. The Mueller investigation, I, uh, frankly, uh, in, in watching the way they're, they're going about this, I'm not necessarily in agreement that it's ready to wind up because, I mean, they've, they broadened this thing so broadly. I mean, there, uh, there were reports came out that they were looking at uh, business dealings of one of the president's, uh, uh, the president's son-in-law in New York. I mean, uh, you know, you start pulling on the string and how far can you go? So I, but that's up to them. I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a different... Uh, Is it going to be a wait and see approach for you to, before you decide like how much of the report should be made public? There's a lot of debate about that right now. Yeah, I, 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 get, I think a wait and see is appropriate always. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know what they, uh, what they focused on or how they went about it. I know, I know a lot, of course, very clearly what we did in the, uh, in the Intel Committee. We are going to publish a report uh, on the Intel Committee and, uh, and some of that, most of it will be things that will be in the public, some of it will be classified, but most of it in the public sector. What's your take on the, the investigations that the Democrats have, have opened up in, you know, since they've taken yeah. control of the House? Um, do you feel that there's uh, some legitimacy there, or are you looking at it as political posture? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, first of all, this is fully predictable. Uh, it, it was predictable that the House would turn over. It always does under the circumstances where one party has the, the House, the Senate, and the White House. So that, that isn't uh, surprising. I think the surprising thing to me about the election where it went was how uh, uh, the radicals, uh, the, the socialist radicals that were elected uh, and put into the, uh, uh, into the United States Congress. I mean, I, I never thought I'd live to see socialists elected to, uh, to Congress, but there they are. And of course, that's pulling the whole Democratic Party to the left. Um, there, there's a lot of hate and vitriol towards the president in, uh, in D.C., both by the national media and by the Democrats. I don't think they can help themselves uh, on the investigations. I think it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, something that they just have to do. They will get to an impeachment, I'm, I'm convinced of, eventually. Uh, they will convict him in the House. It'll come to the Senate. He'll be acquitted in the Senate. You I, really I think, think it's going to come to impeachment? Oh, I, I, don't think I don't think they can help themselves. I, 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 th you know, there's people who have been around a long time that would really like to avoid that. But, you know, the firebrands there that have been elected, the new people are just, uh, they're bound and determined to, to, to charge ahead. I, I just don't think they can help themselves. Um, uh, just along those lines, last question on these uh, issues is, do you think that President Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, was believable? <laughs> You know, I don't know if you followed this, but just this week uh, he, he testified in Congress and they have him on tape saying he never sought a pardon from the President of the United States, uh, nor would he accept one. And his lawyer, Lanny Davis, uh, they have in writing correcting that, saying no, he did do that. So look, I think this guy's told the truth at sometimes. I think he's lied at sometimes. I just don't know when. Uh, uh, I, 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 would think his, I would think I would, I would think that his lawyer would tell him, hey, quit testifying in front of Congress. He's about to go to prison for lying to Congress, and now he just lied to Congress again last week, uh, obviously. So, I, you know, I, 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 people are going to have to make up their own minds on, on what they want to do with Cohen's testimony. Okay. Um, sir, let's get right to the, uh, some of the international uh, issues right now. The, a big vote coming up next week in the Senate regarding funding for the border wall right. and whether uh, to... Uh, block the president's national emergency declaration to get funding to build the wall. How will you vote on that? Well, you know, th this is, people are overthinking this. We got a 2,000 mile border. Border. The last four presidents have constructed uh, 624 miles of wall on that border. Uh, president Trump ran on the promise to the American people that he would do more construction of the wall on the border. Um, the important thing is those four presidents, there were two Republicans, two Democrats, but most importantly, that 624 miles of construction was done by bipartisan funding. Um, I agree with uh, Barack Obama, what he said in 2014, there's a crisis on the, uh, uh, on the southern border. The difference is, in 2014, only 120,000 uh, uh, people em entered the United States illegally on the border. Today, after four months of this fiscal year, there's already 100, almost 150,000 people that have crossed. If it was a crisis in 2014, 
What is it today? I think there's a crisis. The President of the United States, by law, has the ability to declare a national emergency. He did that. In my judgment, it is a national emergency. I think people are overthinking this. I'm going to support his, uh, his uh, uh, move towards uh, doing more security on the southern border. And, and look, this isn't, we sit here and we talk about this antiseptically, uh, but, but you know, when you talk about these, this many people coming across the border, this is really overwhelming our social services, our legal services, and our ability to deal with this. This is a national emergency. Moving to North Korea now, uh -huh. the president's summit with uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un ended without a quote unquote deal. Sure. They, they cut yeah. it short, um, but now there's you know, more evidence that they're continuing to build nuclear weapons and nuclear test sites. Um, also with the uh, hacking of U.S. businesses while the summit was going on. Yeah. How troubling is North Korea in that relationship? Well, North Korea has been troubling for a long, long time. I hit a boiling point. Uh, I, my, my reference point is the Olympics uh, last year because I was over there at, the, at that time. And before uh, that was just the tweets between President well, Trump and Kim yeah, Jong-un. Yeah, and, and it was stuff. more than yeah. just the tweets. I mean, there, the was pro, there, was, there was provocative action at one after the other. Um, start from there. Uh, we were very surprised. Uh, you probably saw I delivered a pretty tough speech in Munich a year ago uh, as to where this thing was headed. We were headed for a very, very bad place that would not be good for the world and really not be good for North Korea. Um, we, we were shocked when we were over there during the closing ceremonies of the Olympics that uh, South Korea uh, texted uh, and, and, uh, and put out a press statement that the North, Korea, North Koreans had contacted him and Kim Jong-un said he was interested in denuclearizing the, South, uh, the Korean Peninsula. And we were shocked at that. This was a 180 degree turn from where we were headed. That was not a bad thing, that was a good thing. Now has it all been good? Of course it hasn't all been good. Uh, the president gets no credit from the national media for, uh, for diffusing that. Uh, he then uh, accepted uh, the uh, discussion of, of going and meeting with them face to face. These were two strong individuals, both with the ability to, to de-escalate this, to walk us back from the edge. They did that. He got virtually no credit for that. Uh, now that you have the second uh, summit come up, and again, the, the national media is dying to call this a failure on the part of the president. Look, this is, a, this is something that's been decades in the making. Uh, this president is working very hard to uh, come to a conclusion on it. I, I held a, uh, a, uh, a closed briefing uh, by uh, uh, Steve Began, who's the, uh, who is the special representative for North Korea, and he took us hour by hour through that, uh, mm -hmm. what happened uh, when, uh, when they were in Hanoi, uh, the two of them. Uh, the discussions were very productive. Uh, they, uh, they did not get to the point where everybody can say, oh, this is wonderful, mm -hmm. it's over. But look, every, every, every American, when they get on their knees at night and say their prayers, they should be praying that this president is, is successful in this. And this is headed in the right direction. It is not headed in the wrong direction. Support the president on this. Do you think that there's uh, any concern that you know, Kim Jong-un used the president to increase his own prestige? And is it, I guess, worth yeah. the risk to take to get yeah, to where you're talking I, I've heard about. that argument, the national media has been making that argument that, oh, this is terrible, you know, he gave him this pr prestige and we didn't get anything. We didn't get anything. We've moved away from what was headed for a really, really bad place. You weigh those two things, a nuclear war versus giving the guy a little bit of prestige, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there every time to do what we need to do to get, to get away from this. Uh, look, um, they need to keep talking, they need to keep working. Steve Biggin's the right guy to do this. He knows this backwards and forwards. We have a very, very clear vision of where we want to go with this. Remember the national uh, media at the time was saying, oh, we shouldn't put President Trump in there. We don't know what he's going to say. We don't know what he's going to do. Uh, you know, we, we, it's, he's going to make a bad deal. President Trump just walked away from a bad deal. Uh, but not to the point where he closed the door. He said, let's keep talking. Well, he's famous are. for also, you know, saying no before getting a yes is one of his deals that he's yeah. talked about in his books yeah. and, you know, the way he's negotiating. Yeah. Yeah. Look, this is, this is headed in the right direction. Let's pray for this president. Let's do everything we can to make him successful on this. Let's take a time out right here. Senator. Okay. We got more to talk to, but you we got to take a break real quick here. Our conversation with Senator Risch continues after the break. We'll talk about China stealing the intellectual property of U.S. businesses, including Micron and uh, other issues involving Russia as well. We'll be right back.
Looking for high quality and low prices? Then Furniture Row's four-day super sale is for you. That's four days where the more you buy, the more you save. Save a hundred bucks on every thousand you spend, no limit. You'll also find huge savings on dining, living, bedroom, and much, much more. Plus, make your cash go further with five years no interest financing. But don't wait. The four-day super sale at Furniture Row ends Monday the 11th. I'm mildly obsessed with numbers. So I started with the stats regarding my moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. Like how Humira has been prescribed to over 300,000 patients. And how many patients saw clear or almost clear skin in just four months. The kind of clearance that can last. Humira targets and blocks a specific source of inflammation that contributes to symptoms. Numbers are great, and seeing clearer skin is pretty awesome too. That's what I call a body of proof. Humira can lower your ability to fight infections. Serious and sometimes fatal infections, including tuberculosis and cancers, including lymphoma, have happened, as have blood, liver, and nervous system problems, serious allergic reactions, and new or worsening heart failure. Tell your doctor if you've been to areas where certain fungal infections are common, and if you've had TB, hepatitis B, are prone to infections, or have flu-like symptoms or sores. Don't start Humira if you have an infection. Want more proof? Ask your dermatologist about Humira. This is my body of proof. The enemy within has taken America captive. I betrayed my country. Help me make that right. And Monday, 13 agents have been killed. There's an operative on the inside. We're going to find them. And you're going to help us. It's her. She's your target. Let me question her. You're not seriously considering this. Pretty right. Everything just cut out. Our video feeds are dead. I can protect you if you help me. The enemy within. Monday after The Voice on NBC. And welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. We're continuing our conversation with Idaho Senator Jim Risch on the big foreign and domestic issues of the day. Senator Risch is the new chairman of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And Senator, again, thank you for your time today. Do appreciate it. Um, in, at the end of January, you pointed to Micron Technology as an example of a company that uh, China stole intellectual property from, ideas. Um, and how serious is that problem from China? Um, it's serious. Let's back up and take an overall uh, view. Uh, when I first got to the Senate 10 years ago, foreign relations was really consumed by terrorism and fighting terrorism. That has slowly changed uh, over the decade to get to a point where it is obvious that the 21st century is going to be a competition between great powers, much like the, much like the uh, uh, 18th century, 17th century, 16th century. But not, a, not as much militarily as economically, but it will be a competition of great powers. Anybody who doesn't study China and watch what China has done, what they're doing going forward, is really going to miss the boat on this. Pick up the document that uh, describes uh, the Chinese view. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Made in China 2025. And it tells you what their vision for China is in 2025. What do they want? They want what America's got. They want a better standard of living uh, for their one and a third billion people. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, every country uh, uh, ascribes uh, uh, to that theory. The, the difficulty with it is they are not going about it in the right way right now. And that is the way you get there is you invent, you innovate, you manufacture, you do the kinds of things that the, a civilized country does. China. Uh, is not using the rule of law and not using international norms to get there. Now, why do I say that? Micron technology really is a poster child for this, and I spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. spreading this message. I had a head-to-head -head conversation with the Chinese ambassador about this and explained uh, uh, how badly this, how bad this is. Um, it, it, he was born for the job of ambassador because I watched him defend the <laughs> attempt to defend the undefendable. And, uh, and, and the, the Micron case is, is classic. They stole the Micron trade secrets, Micron uh, technology patents. They went to China and they patented them and now are suing Micron technology in China. This is not the way civilized people go about this. Um, you license technology, you license things and pay for them, or you innovate it or, and invent it yourself. Now they know they're short of, uh, in, in particularly in the memory chip uh, uh, realm, 
uh, they're short as they go into executing China 2025, and, and they need to do something about that, and that is either buy the chips or, or make them themselves, doing a fair uh, way of uh, going about that. Um, this is a bad thing, and, and we, th this isn't the only case that's, that's like this. There are other uh, cases out there like this, but we need a red line here on this. This has got to be stopped, and it's got to be stopped now, or, or we're going to be in a very bad place as we go forward competing with China. So then where does that leave us with the, the trade war, the tariffs and, and whatnot? Now, I know that they're yeah. working on a deal, yeah. apparently. I spent a lot of time with, uh, with Bob uh, Lighthizer, who is our chief negotiator uh, with China. And obviously, uh, there are a lot of things to talk about. But I've got the, the Micron case uh, right up there for them. And in, in China, a lot of these things are, are settled transactionally. Uh, look, this case needs to be over. But also, it needs to be a case study for how China can't do things as we go forward. And uh, they are negotiating uh, the way that China is doing things. They do things uh, what they would call legally, and they will do things illegally, like the Micron case. But for instance, in China, if you go do if you go to do business in China, you have to share your technology. You've you've got you can't do business in China without taking in Chinese partners. Uh, and of course, the state uh, uh, has has access to all those things. It's just not a, not a way that uh, that. that uh, uh, will serve us well, and for that matter, serve China well uh, as they go forward. All these things are on the table. I really think the president's going to get this done, and I think it's going to get done sooner rather than later. Uh, uh, Donald Trump is either the luckiest or the smartest guy on the planet. When when he laid tariffs on China, I, you know, a lot of us gulped. Uh, I don't like tariffs. We Republicans are, are free traders. We hate tariffs anywhere. We want mm -hmm. everybody have a, a free shot at trading. Human beings can do this. They, but they've done it long before governments were involved in this. Uh, but so when he put the, tra the tariffs on, on China, the tariffs have hurt China, and they've hurt China badly. And so China, uh, China, as a result of that, has to negotiate with us at the table. They're doing it. Um, they're close. I think it's going to get done. We have about a minute and a half left in this sure. segment. I have to get your take on Russia right now. How big of a threat is Russia? We can't do this in a minute and a half. Russia is a huge threat. threat. Yeah. Look, these are bad people. I let, when I first got to, to uh, the Senate, I led the charge against the new start. I said then I characterized the Russians as serial liars and serial cheaters. My opinion has not changed. In fact, if anything, it's hardened. Uh, we can go through a litany of things that they've done. They invaded Georgia and took two... Uh, uh, took two provinces. They, they invaded uh, Ukraine and took the uh, Crimea. Crimea. They're causing trouble on the eastern border of Ukraine. Uh, they, in, with they, elections. they they in, interfered with our elections. But look, they're poisoning people in London. These are bad, bad people. President Trump and the and this and the Republican Congress over the last two years have have done a lot to sanction these people and this government, and we're going to continue at it. The, the Russians are, are, are not good people. Uh, I shouldn't say that they're not. It isn't the people, the Russian people. It's the Russian regime and the way they, uh, the way they do things. It, it, it's it's got to stop. It really does. How do you get them to stop without being a really provocative and you know getting back to a Cold War situation? Yeah. Um, d d look, I, we're already at the Cold War situation. Uh, you know what they just did? In the, they're not learning from the, from the sanctions that we're putting out. What they just recently did to the Ukrainians, seizing their ship in the international waters, seizing the crew. They still got the crew imprisoned. Th this stuff can't go on. This is not the way civilized people do things. And and we're going to continue to ratchet up sanctions. Sooner or later, uh, uh, Putin and uh, and uh, his uh, oligarchs have got to get the idea that uh, life is going to be miserable, miserable for them on this planet because we are the 800-pound gorilla when it comes to uh, when it, when it comes to uh, financial transactions. As an example, and I could go into a lot of detail on that, but we don't have time. Uh, Senator, one more uh, segment to go today. Okay. Again, we'll, we'll be right it. back to continue our conversation with Senator Risch. I'll ask what he has uh, planned for the future. Stay tuned. Picture this, Red Robin's new $10 bundle. Get one of these three gourmet burgers, bottomless fries, and a bottomless beverage for 10 bucks all day, every day. But hurry in, it'll be over in a flash. Red Robin. Yum. KIDO Talk Radio, now at 107.5 FM. Reset your preset to 107.5 FM. Hi, it's Glenn Beck. It's Dave Ramsey. Sean Hannity here, and I'm Kevin Miller. Join me mornings on KIDO Talk Radio, now on 107.5 FM.
unlimited data means no limits on you. Download faster, reach further, and dream bigger. Cable One, high-speed internet, comes home. Idaho invites us to explore breathtaking scenery and pulse-pounding adventure in every season. And Idahoans accept that invitation with gusto. We went in search of people, finding new ways to love winter, and boy, did we find them. <laughs> That's Exploring Idaho. Follow us on YouTube or watch Exploring Idaho at KTVB.com or in the KTVB app. And find more ways to love Idaho in every season. It's got to make you feel good to know that you inspired this. Yeah, it's just... Uh... It's a happy feeling. Now, Rosemary and her Blessing Bike are inspiring people all over the world. Tonight on the News at 10. Picture this, Red Robin's new $10 bundle. Get one of these three gourmet burgers, bottomless fries, and a bottomless beverage for 10 bucks. All day, every day. But hurry in, it'll be over in a flash. Red Robin. Yum. And we're back with Idaho Senator Jim Risch. Uh, Senator, first of all, I guess, uh, you're up for re-election in 2020 for a third term. Have you decided yet if you'll run? Yeah, I've said publicly always that uh, in, in recent times that I have uh, made, I've crossed that bridge. We're putting together a campaign organization already, uh, raising money, which is everybody hates to do, but it has to be done. So uh, look, I'm, uh, it's, it's taken me 10 years to get here. It's taken uh, Idaho 10 years to, to have somebody on foreign relations and intelligence, which we haven't had in 30, uh, 30 some years. Uh, so uh, we have a, a, a huge treaty coming up that's a big deal for Idaho. The Columbia River Treaty that expires in 2024, it's being rego renegotiated right now. And all people outside of Idaho want is what we've got, Idaho's water. And that treaty has to come through the Foreign Relations Committee, has to cross my desk before it ever goes to the Senate floor. So it's, I'm, I feel uh, I've got something to add to that and, uh, and I'm gonna be there to fight for Idaho's water. And we've got a lot of other things going on that are important for Idaho. So uh, uh, this is, a, like you pointed out, this is a fascinating time to be involved in this. Uh, we're, we're working hard at it and, uh, and I, th I think I still have something to contribute. So I'm, I am, I'm gonna run again. 15 seconds, you're gonna be 77 at the time of election. How long do you think you want to keep doing this? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you, you, my kids ask me those kind of questions, you know. But look, my health's good. Uh, uh, I, I've got a lifetime of experience behind me in these kinds of things. And I, I, th I think I still have uh, something to add. And if the people of Idaho agree with me, I'll be honored uh, again to serve. All right. And then we'll thank see you. who will be running against you as thank well. You. Senator Risch, thank you so much for your all time right. today. Yeah, I certainly do you. appreciate it. And that is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's morning news and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint.